So thank you so much Absolutely. for joining us, Andrew. Absolutely. That's greatly appreciate it. Before we get started and we talk about the business of developing artists and your approach to being an artist-friendly label, if you don't mind talking to me a little bit about your path in the industry. Clearly, we're, we're here in school. Uh, all of these folks here soon enough will be in our industry. If you don't mind talking a little bit about how you got to where you are now. Okay. Um, I grew up in Michigan and um, uh, used to be the guy that always wanted to figure out how things worked. So uh, I ran the school dances, uh, had a sound system, and my buddies had records. And so that was my first foray into the music industry. Um, I was going to go to the Coast Guard Academy and got cut in the finals and had visited Belmont College in Nashville with one of my friends who wanted to be a songwriter. And um, they had a studio. And, it had, and I was like, man, people actually could go to school to learn how to do this. And they said, sure. And they offered me a scholarship. And I said, nah, I'm going to Coast Guard, you know. And, and, um, and uh, I got cut and I called them back. And so next thing I know, I'm in Nashville. No understanding why I'm there, you know, just, I kind of believe in divine intervention and the, the path, you know, just a door will open for you. And uh, um, came down, studied uh, music business and um, went to work for Emerald uh, Sound Studios back in um, 89. And uh, it was one of the three big uh, recording studios in Nashville. Um, and we had an entertainment, uh, uh, inter uh, uh, entertainment network where we did syndicated radio shows, we did a studio, and um, um, the owner uh, decided to move back to Montana and threw me the keys and said, send me reports. And so uh, we grew that uh, from uh, one studio to uh, five buildings with uh, five divisions. It had mas we bought Masterphonics, we had a, a, a post audio division, uh, and I did that for probably about 17 years. and. Um, when the uh, consolidation of all the music industry and all the uh, record labels started buying each other, um, the number of sessions started you know, becoming less and less. And uh, uh, one of the uh, people that uh, worked for me said, you need to meet this guy, Scott Bruschetta. And I said, okay, well, he's gonna start a record label. I was like, okay, just what we need, one more record label. And so um, it took us about a month and we went to lunch and it was like we knew each other forever. Um, we both love cars and my dad grew up working on cars and the mechanical stuff, and uh, next thing I know, uh, he calls me and says, hey, come see this building. We're gonna, we're, this is gonna be the name of it. It's gonna be Big Machine. I was like, Big Machine? That's a, kind of a crazy name for, he goes, well, it's kind of ironic. You know, we're this little indie label, and we're gonna start in this little house. And so, literally, um, I told the f folks that uh, were, in the we're in the process of selling the studio for the, the owner, and uh, um, I told him, I've got another job, and I'm going to go work for a label. So I was employee number two at Big Machine and uh, wired the building. Uh, and was my first duties were, you know, uh, basically doing all of the back office, um, so uh, the operations and the general manager. And that's where it started back in 2005. Awesome. I if you don't mind, I if you could elaborate a little bit on your duties as the COO, and also uh, do you find that there to be any synergy between that and your previous career with the studio? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot. I mean, uh, basically uh, at, at Emerald, at the studio, I was kind of, I oversaw, uh, you know, human resources, IT, uh, accounting, uh, business affairs. And that's essentially kind of my role with the label is, is um, Scott is the rainmaker and uh, he hi goes out and he, he has that connection with artists and, and artists gravitate to him and, and um, he takes care of the music and I take care of everything else. Gotcha. So, uh, and, and if you could talk a little bit about, you know, we're talking about artist friendly label. What, what do you feel it is about Big Machine that you've gotten that reputation? Is it something about the culture? Is it specifically relationships with particular artists? Obviously Taylor Swift. Right is uh, one of your, well, one of the industry's biggest artists. Sure. You could talk a little bit about that. Well, I think it all starts kind of with um, our, the major labels were always so difficult. So in, in the studio industry, you know, we would, just from trying to get paid and, and the, the, I guess the uh, bureaucracy of a major label, uh, just because you're so big and you have so many pro projects going on, then there's processes that you have to have. 
and that slows down the process. And so he and I had talked early on to say, you know, what I want to do is I want to make sure that uh, when we go rent a studio, they get paid in two weeks. You know, when, when we, and, and when we send an artist statement, it has to be transparent. The artist needs to be able to read their own royalty statement. I think uh, we had kind of grown up in an industry where the major labels were um, kind of this behind the curtain, and we wanted to pull that back and just have complete transparency and have more of a relationship with our artists and be a partner with our artists. And um, early on, I think, you know, Taylor was probably one of the first um, in Nashville from the standpoint, that was when 360 deals were coming in. And so the labels, uh, there was all these slices of the pie. So there's the publisher and then there's the, the live touring and then there's the merchandise and then there's the record label. And everybody kind of has their own little um, fiefdom, if you will. And they're all working against each other instead of with each other. And the great thing with uh, our artists were, uh, more early ones that we signed were all singer-songwriters, so they controlled their publishing. They, you know, they hadn't gotten big enough yet that there was a business manager involved. There wasn't uh, a lot of these other kind of interests, and so it helped us align a brand and, and really uh, focus on that artist in all aspects of it. And so uh, rather than worrying about uh, early on, I know uh, streaming, you know, we're giving away music, but we always say there's kind of a zero to hero effect, and um, early on, you, you have to expose that artist to as many people as possible. And so dealing with all the various rights holders in that process, whether it be you know, giving away merch or giving away music or things, if everybody's aligned to say, hey, we're going to grow this artist brand and we're all going to give a little bit in the beginning, but at the end, we're all going to benefit. And I think that she's a perfect example of uh, really knowing who she wanted to be, where she wanted to go, and also you know, being a great partner with, with us to say, well, I trust you to do, you know, to be my partner in this. And, uh, you know, she started her own management company. She started her own touring company. She started her own merch company. She, she basically controls every aspect of her uh, business. And then uh, Big Machine does the record side of it. Indeed. And, and, you know, what's interesting is when you see a huge act like a Taylor Swift, at the, and, and, and your name maybe is misleading, at least at the beginning, Big Machine. That's what we think <laughs> about when we think about major record labels. You know, I don't know if folks could appreciate, you know, what it means for an independent to create that level of success. I mean, clearly we see major labels do it on a regular basis, and we have for years. But if you don't mind helping folks differentiate between, let's say, how a major label, you know, does that. I mean, that's part of their job. And what it really means when an independent does that and what it takes for an independent to really be able to make something like that happen on that type of scale. Well, our, our, our business model is a lot different than the majors. The majors, you know, would uh, our partner in New York is Republic, and, and they've got 100 acts. And uh, our focus was to keep our roster between five and eight artists. So Big Machine started, and um, we didn't ever want to grow uh, bigger than five active acts with three in development. So... Um, our teams were, were kind of built around that structure. And, and, you know, we're very specific in what we do, so we're country. And so um, country uh, genre has a very um, great sweet spot. It, has a, it still has a very strong physical base. It still has uh, you know, country radio or terrestrial radio is still kind of the number one driver of sales and exposure of new acts. And so it's a very traditional model. Uh, and it's... Um, and, and the great thing is, is that uh, the artists and, and the brands that you build have this long-lasting uh, relationship with their fans. Um, it's not a singles-driven uh, business as much as it's a, an album-oriented or a lifestyle. And so it really helped us to be able to grow those brands and grow those relationships with those fans and have like a, a longer tail, you know. So um, whereas pop artists, you know, they'll have this great single and then you never hear from them again. And, and, it, and it's a very fickle audience, whereas the country consumer really buys into that artist. And country radio actually is, is, is very much the same way. Um, pop radio, they're very singles driven. So you come with a great single, they'll play that single, and you spend a lot of time and energy trying to get that one single played, whereas in country radio, they, we, we call them the gatekeepers. Uh, and uh, a lot of the PDs want to hear your second, third, fourth single. They want to know that you have the music that's going to really be great for their brand. So it's, a, it's more of a relationship. Uh, and so that's 
I think I've kind of gotten off track a little bit, but you know, the, uh, to, to that extent, w we really feel like uh, you know, the big machine, uh, it was ironic, the name was supposed to be ironic, but um, it was supposed to be very focused on uh, those five artists. And um, Scott came to, to me in, in 2007, I think it is, and said, hey, you know, I think at, at that time, some of the majors, we'd had some success with Taylor and, and a lot of the majors, come knocking on the door wanting to buy and um, they just, they, we didn't want to become that. So he said, what do you think about us making an investment in ourselves? You know, he said, every time we've invested in ourselves and our artists, it's really turned out. And what if I started a new label and we just created a new promotions team and make them kind of the brand managers for uh, this next set of five artists? Do you feel like our infrastructure could uh, handle that on a sales marketing and you know, finance and, um, and I said, I think, I think we could do that. So we added another promotions team and, and Valerie Music was started. And so um, that's kind of been our model is, is just to keep it very specific. And then again, uh, we had artists that were, were waiting in the wings uh, wanting to, to be on our label and we just couldn't, we couldn't give them the, the proper attention. And I think that's the, that was the hardest thing for us is to turn an artist away because we just couldn't give them the right attention. And um, so that's been part of our model. Uh, but we started uh, Valerie Music Company, and then um, in 2009, we started uh, Republic Nashville. And then this last, uh, in 2014, we started two labels. We started Dot Records and Icon Nashville. And if, if you don't mind distinguishing between those brands, you know, sure. clearly they're all under the big machine label group. But I'm curious how those operate. Uh, under that umbrella. So in other words, are there certain decisions that are made outside of Big Machine because you have partners mm -hmm. outside? Uh, are artists, depending on their audience, depending on maybe how long they've been around or the demographics of that audience, steered toward one label versus another? Or what are the dynamics between those different I, I, brands? I, you know, we, we leave it more to each one of the teams really buying into the act. I think, um, you know, the, Valerie, kind of became this redneck label. <laughs> you know, it started off, it actually started off with Jewel, uh, Reba, and Justin Moore uh, were our first three acts. And, um, but, you know, now we've got Brantley Gilbert, we've got uh, Thomas Rhett, and, 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 and it's, it's become kind of more of the, the traditional country, you know, or rocking country. Uh, Big Machine has kind of always been the, the superstar label. So, um, you know, it's kind of hard for another artist to be in the shadow of, of a Taylor Swift and to get that attention from that team. But, you know, we, we have Rascal Flatts and Tim McGraw uh, on that label. And then we've got the new, uh, the Cadillac 3, which is a, a new young act that we've got there. But Republic started, uh, and, and basically Republic started out of um, the Universal wanting to continue to say, hey, we want to buy you. And, and we said, you know what, let's, let's figure out a way that we can work together and partner. So Republic was our first joint venture. And um, it was our first experience to partner with a major label and to really kind of be able to see, and, and, the, and the thought process was, let's, let's look under the hood of a major label and see the good and the bad about it and um, really understand how they function, use their money to uh, uh, kind of seed uh, the acts. And, um, and, it, and it worked. I mean, we, we've got the Van Perry, Florida Georgia Line, um, Daniel Bradbury, um, uh, Cassidy Pope, um, and, and forgive me, I mean, we've got so many acts and, and none of them I, I, I want to forget, but um, the great thing there was is that some of the majors have some great relationships as far as the A&R process, the voice. Um, so our, our, our connection with um, the voice um, comes through Republic. So uh, Republic Records is the, the designated label for the voice. And if it's pop, it goes to Republic. And if it's country, we're the designated kind of compartment in Nashville for that. So uh, it's allowed us to um, kind of have a funnel of some, some great talent. And uh, Ray Lynn uh, is, is also uh, uh, came out of the voice. And, um, and, and then we started a publishing company as well because we realized that a lot of our singer-songwriters uh, and a lot of the new acts that needed to be kind of cultivated, you sign an act and immediately they want to put a radio single out and go out on the road and sometimes they're just not ready. And, but sometimes you have to sign an act early uh, in order to keep them from, being, from signing with somebody else. There's a competition. So, um, but we're very focused on being, doing what's right for the music. And so it, you know, we always say it always starts with the music, and I know that's kind of a mantra. But the the great thing about you know the the 
success of the Taylor and, and the Tim and, and the and the Roscoe Flats is that our infrastructure costs were, were relatively low. And so those acts allowed us to pretty much have this nest egg that uh, we didn't have to worry about money anymore. And if you're running a business when you don't have to worry about money, it's amazing how your vision changes and how you can really focus on what's important. Um, so many labels have this release schedule where they have to put out X amount of releases a quarter just to hit their numbers. And, and it's kind of like throwing it against the wall and seeing what sticks. Where we'll put a single out and chart that trajectory of the single, and when it hits critical mask, you know, maybe that top 10 or number one, that's where we try to drop the record so that we feel like there's enough people out there that understand or know that that's gonna happen. And, um, and if it doesn't work, we go to the second single. We just move the release date, and we just don't put a record out, and we wait, and we might do an EP. And I think that's kind of a, a new um, process that we're, we're starting to really see is that a lot of times it takes a lot longer to, to um, introduce an act and to get that critical mass of that fan base for a new act. So we'll do an EP where the, the fans get a sampling of music and then we can bring the, uh, get to two to three singles and then bring the album out later and, and it's, it's really worked for us. Indeed, and if you don't mind, uh, I think, to help distinguish between how, what your relationship is with Universal, because a lot of folks hear Universal and they automatically would assume that Universal owns Big Machine or that they're the ones that kind of dictates is that Universal, right. uh, you know, who you sign or how you do what you do. If you don't mind distinguishing that relationship, in other words, you know, the, the, the fact that they, I would imagine, provide distribution services and maybe some other services, but they don't necessarily call the shots, am I correct? A absolutely, we're 100% we're control of, of our destiny, including our joint venture labels. They, they partnered with us because they wanted <laughs> us, <laughs> and, and they wanted what we do, and um, they, they are our distribution company. Um, we have worldwide distribution, which is also a, a, you know, kind of as we grow our business, that's, that's where our growth pattern is, is, is country music specifically. The, the, the markets are, you know, the United States, Canada is the second uh, largest market, and then Australia. And then past that, um, it really skews to more of a pop market. So worldwide distribution for us was challenging, but Taylor um, saw that and kind of has shifted to that world um, she had the ability to, to really see that her fan base, if she wanted to be a worldwide artist, she needed to shift, you know, to, to a more worldwide uh, platform. And she's really done that very authentically and very, uh, very well. And, and she's allowed us to really open some doors and get uh, international distribution. Uh, we were able to also convert some of our distribution deals. I, I don't know if everybody knows, but um, for the most part, and domestically, when you, uh, we have a, a P&D, which is a pressing and distribution uh, deal with Universal, where we pay for everything, um, but they essentially help us manufacture and get physical product into that, and then we use their deals with the DSPs to deliver our music. And in return, they collect the money and pass it through to us, and they take a, a distribution fee. Um, outside of the United States, most other uh, record labels have what's called a licensing deal. So you license your music to these other record labels in these other territories. But Big Machine with the, has, has been able to leverage uh, you know, the, the success of, of a lot of their artists and, and has P&D deals now uh, in Canada and in Australia and in Japan. And so we essentially um, make money at the source uh, at, in all those territories and we truly have global uh, distribution through uh, Universal, and they help us with certain promotion and marketing services outside the United States, but in Canada and, and in the U.S., we, we, we basically function as the entire label. And in fact, we do um, all of the label services for our joint venture labels, uh, even though um, you know, they're, they're actually, those acts are actually signed to Universal. Interesting. If, if you don't mind, if we could talk a little bit about breaking the rules. Um, you know, I would imagine that to survive in an industry that is always evolving more and more every day, you have to break the rules. And I think we've seen some good examples of that with big examples of that with big machines. So for example, the fact that uh, Mr. Scott Borchetta was able to negotiate artists royalties for from one of the biggest broadcasters ever, Clear Channel sure. Now, sure. um, iHeartMedia. If you don't mind talking a little bit about some of those initiatives that are kind of helping to change the way that the industry 
um, is evolving. Sure. Um, big, I don't know if you guys know, but Big Machine was the first um, record label in the United States to pay its uh, artists a terrestrial royalty. Um, and that kind of came about basically because in, in the, I guess, in the political realm, uh, the, you had the NAB and, and Sound Exchange all f fighting about this. And w we just felt like it became such a politicalized event that we wanted to really go to our, our partners at radio, uh, Clear Channel, uh, now iHeart, um, was and, and is one of our, our best partners. Terrestrial Radio is still the best way that we can expose our new music. And their need to, to convert their, their business from um, terrestrial to um, IP streaming, um, and they were basically put in a, um, they basically have to compete with Pandora, wherein Pandora pays half the rate that they do. So I don't know if everybody knows it's a greater of formula of um, a, a per stream rate or 25% uh, of their gross revenues. And, um, you know, if you look at what iHeart makes, 25% of their revenues, their advertising revenues is a lot different uh, in a conversation than 25% of Pandora's. So that said, um, they wanted to figure out how they could, you know, test this model and transition into... Um, uh, moving their customer base to iHeartRadio. And so we, we felt like it was a great approach for us to partner with them, um, get pick up terrestrial royalties and, and give them a little bit of a discount. I mean, Pandora already had the discount uh, on the um, streaming side. And it had become such a political thing that um, we just, Bob Pittman flew in and sat in a, we call it the cage, we got this little conference room and hammered out a deal and and next thing I know, uh, we're, you know, it, it, it can be done. I mean, uh, and I think that's our approach, not only with our artists, but also with our other business partners, is, is to partner with people and figure out how we can work together as opposed to everybody fighting again, fighting to keep their peace. And um, I think they, they see it as a huge uh, win for them. Uh, we've got about a 30% uplift in, our, our, in that income stream. So... Um, I think it's been a great win for us, um, and it's also a great um, calling card for us to tell our artists, if you sign with us, we're going to pay you in places that uh, the majors won't. Indeed. And speaking of breaking the rules and also working with, or maybe not working with, some industry partners, if, if you don't mind, could you address a little bit um, the circumstances around Spotify and big machine doing something that was quite bold, which was to take their biggest artists and others off of that streaming platform when, for many, you know, they've been touted as a, you know, beacon of hope in the music industry. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the main thing is, is that streaming, we're, we're not anti-streaming. I mean, terrestrial radio is streaming. I mean, it flips over to IP and, and it's, it's essentially streaming, but there's a big difference between interactive and non-interactive. And um, interactive, uh, is, you know, basically um, there is a need for a tool to fight piracy. And Spotify is an excellent tool to uh, fight piracy. And when you looked at Sweden and some of those territories where they had zero music business, it was all due to piracy, um, people just stealing music. And um, they've found a way to legitimize that and, and to take that on. The hard part is that when it... it their business model was to grow that and to expand that worldwide. But uh, the idea of sometimes just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it, uh, is we have this really strong physical and download business in the United States, and um, we kind of liken it to the movie industry. So when, you, when a new blockbuster comes out, you can't go see it on Netflix. You go see it in the movie theater, and then it's windowed. Uh, and, and then you can have it on DVD, and then eventually it'll be on Netflix on that. So every market segment, uh, you maximize the value. And it, and it, it would be a really uh, a shame for us to kind of allow someone to, you know, get the music for free when they, you know, their friend, you know, just bought Taylor's new record for, you know, eight, the deluxe with the photos and all that for $18, and they go, yeah, I got it for free. Uh, you know, and so we don't want to make schmucks out of our customers. And I think the, the other key thing is, is that um, free streaming uh, or ad-supported streaming as opposed to subscription. So in the digital world, it used to be real easy. There was physical records <laughs> and digital downloads. Now with streaming and all the tiers and all of the rate structures, um, they're all negotiated by the major labels. So uh, essentially, 
you know, they came to us and said, here's the deal. Here's how much we're going to pay you. Uh, take it or leave it. And we just said, we're going to leave it. You know, we're, uh, we, we don't feel like 650 streams of a song equaling one download on the ad-supported side it really makes sense for us. And so if you want to just put it in just the subscription only where that's about 150 streams, that's, that's the difference between the ad-supported side and the, and the download, it's it, specifically to Spotify. Um, other services like Xbox Music and Google actually have a almost 35 to, to 40 stream equals a download right. ratio just based on uh, dynamics. I mean, it's all math. What your subscription is divided by the number of streams and then your market share of that stream. And so um, the math for us for the ad supported just didn't work. And so uh, we said, you know, if you'll leave us just premium only, we, we'll be on your service and said, no, nope, it's, it's, this is the way it is. And we said, well, that doesn't work for us. And, right. and it became this huge political thing. We were against Spotify and everything. And, and we're not against Spotify. We're just against their ad-supported model. And, and for that matter, YouTube. I mean, uh, this young generation of, of kids, that's where they go discover new music. But the reality is, is if you can sit there and just play the song over and over again on demand as much as you want, what's the motivation to ever go buy it? What's the motivation to ever go uh, actually support <laughs> the industry, you know, that, that uh, we're all trying to work in. And um, we're trying to do the right thing for our business. We, we know that streaming is, is, a, is a new consumption pattern. We just want to work with the industry to try to get that uh, to a place where um, the monetization structure works for us. And um, there's a lot of great um, companies out there that are really making strides to make that happen. I mean, we, we stream our singles, which then we make videos, and we put those videos on um, Vivo, and Vivo structures is a lot better than, uh, say, the, even the YouTube structure. So um, I don't know if you guys have tried to find 1989 on YouTube, but hopefully you can't, because we've um, we basically hired a, a team to um, take music off of YouTube constantly. Um, that's the hard, t that's, that's, and that's the disadvantage for Spotify and some of those other legitimate streaming services is we have the ability to say, we don't want to be on your service, and they can't have our music on their service. YouTube hides behind the DMCA Act, and, and basically you have to go find it, you have to notify them, they pull it down, then they just put it right back, and then users just put it back up. And there's no way for us to filter and stop our music from being on YouTube, so you have to actively go pull down your music constantly. And, and it's, it, that's, that's one of the things that uh, is really difficult for us. You know, it, it, it does have promotional value, it does, um, but when you basically take, you know, and, and for a, an artist that's at, you know, from that, beginning stages, that exposure is great, but when you get a, a tailor, um, you want to do the right thing for her music and, and monetize it at the highest level to be able to afford for her to make her next record and to do a lot of other things, so, and for us to pay our employees and pay our paid internships and... <laughs> and, the, and, and that's, you know, obviously a big deal, the fact that, you know, free is great, but there's a business here right and people need to make a living, and if you find value in music, I mean, music has changed people's perspectives and lives in many right. ways. So, you know, I, I guess what was kind of interesting to see in that, uh, the way that that played out was almost as though it was a mandate, like the music had to be there, mm -hmm. and Big Machine made the decision that no, it doesn't have to be oh, there. And, and, and Taylor, you know, very much was adamant that you know, music has value, and, and, and so, Again, that's, that's, the, that's the beauty when you have a, a like mind with your artist and, and you are a team as opposed to uh, just being this big bad label. And, you know, the, the, majors, uh, you know, the majors' decisions to g be on Spotify and some of those are completely different. Um, I don't know if everybody knows or not, but, you know, the majors uh, basically go in and since they control uh, these huge chunks of market share, uh, which sometimes our music gets rolled up and, and is, is sold, uh, you know, as a, as a piece of someone's market share, um, they get paid a huge advance, <laughs> which is basically the service just saying, here, here's, here's a lot of money, and then uh, basically as the streams come through, we'll just, we'll take that out. And if in any given year, their deal, they didn't stream through or they didn't sell through, that major label gets to keep that money and not share it. Um, and our structure with uh, a lot of those deals are they didn't share it with us. And so um, we also don't want to be in that advance type 
scenario, we, we would re very much like to earn our money and earn our market share. We just want a level playing field. Indeed. If, if we could talk a little bit about taking risks, big deal in the, in the industry today, right, to be able to stand out. Um, and I guess in hindsight, you know, when you look at 1989 and before that red, you know, clearly it, there was some, you know, good decisions made on behalf of how that album was put together and what it sounded like and it resonates with so many people. But do you think that there was a significant risk there in, you know, that very poppy approach for a country artist or at least what? Uh, originally, well, who she originally started out as a country artist. Yeah. Today she's a pop star, right? Yeah, there, there, that was, I think, the, the, um, the trajectory of, of her moving from a country artist to a world, you know, worldwide superstar. Um, there, there was risk, but I, I think it was very calculated on her part. I mean, uh, that's, that's the amazing thing. I mean, and, and I, I don't mean this any disrespect to any other artist, but there just isn't another artist that even is close to her um, understanding of her customer, understanding of who she is. I mean, the, what, what sold me is is sitting downstairs in the cage, <laughs> um, which is this little conference room that uh, we kind of made funky because it was <laughs> so small. And uh, hearing this 14-year-old barefoot play these songs, uh, it was just like, wow, she knows exactly who she wants to be at that age, and she's done nothing but just continue to build that. I mean, and when she came in, she already had a publishing deal. Um, she already had 100 songs. And when you have an artist where, when it comes to time to put out a record, you're trying to pare down the record. You're trying to narrow it down to 22 songs as opposed to go find, <laughs> you've got two songs and you need to go find another, you know, eight songs, which is, is what we do on a regular basis is not very often do artists come in with 10 singles, 12 singles, you know, but Taylor comes in with 22 singles. I mean, 22 singles and puts it on a record and then connects with a, a fan base and spends time building this, you know, she understands social media. She was the first social media artist. I mean, she had, back when MySpace, <laughs> she had, she had 100,000, you know, followers when she, we signed her. This 14-year-old had 100,000 MySpace fans, you know, and, and grew it. Um, uh, we started a Facebook page for her when Facebook came out, and she's like, no, nope, I want to be MySpace, and, and everybody kind of knows that, you know, Facebook took over, but her social reach is just astounding. And so um, I think, I think th she's just an alien. I mean, she just, she, she, she sets, she, she, she constantly is creating. And when you have someone like that that is constantly creating and knows who they want to be and knows that her music is connecting, I, I, I think it was a very, um, I don't think it was a risk as much as is just a calculated approach as to the next phase of her, her career. Gotcha. And I believe we have some questions that are going to come through for our folks here uh, on campus that are tweeting uh, questions and also those folks online. So as I'm waiting for these to pop up here, I do have one more question. Okay. In regard to risk, a totally different group, Florida Georgia Line, and the Cruise remix with Nelly. I mean, again, w w do you feel that was a significant risk? I mean, rap and hip hop, I mean, granted, we're seeing that trend now, but you know, they, I'm sure that there were a lot of people that might have been off put a little bit about that. I believe some writer called uh, the president of the company uh, the, the country antichrist or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't, yeah, we, we don't really worry about what people think of us, but, um, and, I, and I think that's, that's the important part is you just have to be comfortable in your skin. And Florida Georgia Line is, is just, you know, another, another one of those acts that just, you know, Belmont, they went to Belmont and uh, um, they met in, in college and, and spent their time growing this fan base uh, out on the road the hard way in a van, you know, going show to show to show. And, and when uh, one of our uh, promotion reps uh, saw them open for another act and basically the, they were the opening act and when they got done, the entire audience, half the audience left <laughs> and didn't stay for the, the, the other act. They go, we need to see this act. We need to, you know, and, and they had already started, you know, building that fan base, but the, their connection and their, um, 
their understanding of music in general and that country d is one of the few formats that doesn't that doesn't have you know there's not a hot ac or an urban or a or a you know pop music has all of these categories where there's just country music and country music is is kind of becoming the new aor you know uh, elmorian uh, rock and it's got a lot of breadth in where it goes, and, and adding that R&B, it was a natural thing, because uh, the, the connection with Atlanta and, and a lot of that uh, soul from music is, is really tied to um, country as well. And um, our partner in, in New York with, with Republic made that an easier process, but um, you know, as, as our little company, I think we're, we're pretty excited. We have, uh, for country singles, we have, um, four of the top five best-selling country singles of all time. So um, it's it's not bad coming from our little house. Indeed. And a lot of it has to do with branding, right? I mean, obviously not every country artist would be a perfect fit for a collaboration with right. a platinum rapper. Right. Uh, if you don't mind talking about that today, I mean, branding is a huge deal in the music business. Once upon a time, you know, it was almost an ugly word if, you know, you Selling kind it. of associated the word brand and, you know, recording artists, rock and roll, music. Um, you know, it was kind of like one of these things that made it less authentic. Today, it's almost a necessity, and it is a necessity, and it's also widely accepted, and it's really part of the way the business is shaping up. If you don't mind talking a little bit about some of the partnerships that you've helped facilitate between artists uh, on your labels and brands. Sure. So uh, some of our big partnerships, uh, obviously one of the biggest is, is our partnership with General Mills. Um, uh, General Mills came to us and said, you know, we've got this uh, platform that's a hunger platform where um, we every year there's a, a real true hunger need from um, uh, April to um, May, when the kids get out of school, you know, they're all on hot lunch, and then all of a sudden they don't have hot lunch. And so that beginning part of, of the summer, and um, we're trying to grow awareness of, of that. And we'd really love to leverage some of your artists um, to help us do that. And so we worked together with them, and we built um, out the Outnumber Hunger uh, platform that we do, and, and essentially all our artists um, that are participating in that year go around and do activations to, to create awareness of this need. And when they buy General Mills products, um, they can type in a code and, and five meals go right directly to the food bank in that zip code. Uh, and then all of our artists' uh, photos are on you know, 30 million, uh, this last year was 70 million uh, packages. And so for our little label group, it's a great exposure method that we're in supermarkets where you can't, you can't get music in the supermarkets. You can't get that uh, footprint. And so um, we're trying to grow that branding. But it also is a great thing for, you know, outreach and awareness of the problem. And, and our artists have really helped us buy into that. And that's, I think that's the authentic authenticness of country music is that they, they, they do have a very caring uh, and, and uh, blue collar, you know, uh, approach to it. The other thing is, you know, there, there's been plenty other brands that uh, have come in. Target, I mean, has really stepped up. And, and when they when we partner with uh, Target for our deluxe releases, you know, they step up and they really give us that advertising uh, component that uh, is really difficult from when, when we're only making money uh, you know, the label only generates money off the album sales, whereas, you know, we always tell an artist when we sign with you or sign them that if we do our job right, we're going to be the fifth smallest source of income to you. You know, your first one's going to be touring, then you're going to be endorsements, and then there's going to be merchandise, and then publishing, and then us. Um, and so um, that's what we want is, is when that happens <laughs> and you look down and you say, why is my royalty check, you know, the fifth, then we've done our job right because all of those other sources of income all stemmed out of that initial, uh, the, it has to start with the music, but, you know, the, the touring and, and all of those other things come when you have that fan base that we help build. And so building that process is, is, is that exposure method. It's how do you expose your music to new audiences um, you know, the reality is, is if we could sell our music to just one percent of the population, we'd we'd be doing excellent. So you think about that. That other ninety-nine percent. How do you get in front of them? How do you have them understand who this is? I mean, Taylor's an anomaly. I, I I don't know that there's too many people in the United States that haven't heard of Taylor Swift, but 
you haven't heard of TC3, you haven't heard of, you know, some haven't even heard of Rascal Flats. And so how do we leverage with partners to leverage their advertising and their exposure to those um, different um, pockets of people and potentially make that link, especially when you can form a bond that's an authentic bond between that brand and, and, the, and the artist, it really works. I mean, um, Justin Moore, who's very country, very, you know, he's an Arkansas boy that's just um, redneck as they come and just the sweetest, but um, perfect connection is he's paired with Diageo, which is Crown Royal and, and some of those other things. We've partnered with Crown Royal these last three or four years on the Brickyard uh, 400, so we're a title sponsor on the Brickyard 400, but the tie-in was is they have a, a, a Name Your Hero, where they go out and they they go find these, these small town heroes, whether it be a firefighter or a military person that um, their family nominates them for, and, and Justin comes and, and, and it's, a, it's a great process, and um, it's the name of the, the Brickyard 400 is named after this hero. And so it's such a great uplifting thing that this person from a small town finally gets recognized, and, and then it partners with Diageo and, and the brand Crown Royal, and then that exposure uh, on the race and on NASCAR and on all those other things. It, it, and Justin being partnered with that uh, exposes him to that uh, community, and it really ties in with that uh, um, kind of feeling. So we, we try to partner with brands that really help us um, expose our music and, you know, Every now and then they'll pay for a video. Uh, American Express uh, partnered with us on Taylor's uh, Blank Space. And um, they, they basically did this video and did an interactive uh, um, app that, that connects to it. And so we try to find ways that um, there, it's a win-win for both parties. Um, we did um, a, a, a train ride across the United States with Reba, or with uh, Martina. And, um, you know, so we partnered with Amtrak and some other brands to do that. And, and so we, we, we try to figure out what's the next big thing, because uh, when we have an album release coming out, we want everybody in the United States to know this album is out. And so we try to make these big events and these brands really get into that and, 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 and like the idea of creating these great events. And, and that's a big deal. I mean, clearly in the social media space, it is about that connection with your audience and it does seem like you're fostering connection with community. Sure. You know, clearly, and, and it has to be organic, right? Mm -hmm. I, I did love, by the way, the Amtrak um, campaign. If you don't mind elaborating on that, I mean, it was like a, was it a cross-country train? It, it, was, it, was, it was all the way across the country, and um, we, we established stops along the way where, um, you know, and the, they, they actually wrapped an Amtrak train <laughs> with Martina's, uh, you know, uh, logo, and, and, and it, it promoted Outnumber Hunger, it, 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 you know, that platform, and she would get off the train at certain stops, and there would be a stage, and she'd perform uh, for the crowd, and, and so it was, it was our album launch. Um, week and so I don't know if everybody knows, but when a, when a, an album comes out on Tuesdays, uh, we call that Street Week, and so you try to have all of these events lined up for that week where um, people learn about the record. And so the best thing we could do is have the New York and the LA and have all of these the two media capitals, and then all the way in between have Middle America uh, where we could stop off on the train. And it, uh, Amtrak partnered with us, you know, General Mills partnered, and it was it was that collaboration, and, and I think we got a lot of uh, media attention out of it, so. Indeed. And speaking of attention, I mean, obviously, today, a big part of how artists get attention and maintain attention is social media. But social media is so fleeting, you know, between the fact that every single day I can't remember how many viral videos <laughs> someone sends me or I see on, on television, someone talking about it. Uh, obviously on Twitter, you know, there's more messages than you could ever consume. Sure. If you don't mind talking a little bit about how you balance that, how you leverage that with, I would imagine the end goal, which is longevity. So in an environment of, you know, really fleeting overnight, I don't know, some people have described it as almost a, not a medical condition, but an ADD kind of media, deficit for attention in that space, how do you foster an environment of longevity for artists? I mean, Taylor Swift now has been a decade, which is almost sure. hard to believe, being that she's so young. Right. 
Well, I, I, I think a big part of that is music and new music and has continued. I, I think had a lot of artists had consistent singles over, over the, uh, their lifespan. Um, you know, the, the hard part with, the, with, with pop music is very, it's so single oriented that they could have this huge single and the next single and the third single and the three of them don't sound alike and, or don't maintain, capture that audience. And it's, um, it is a fickle crowd. Um, and they are looking for that new thing, and there's and it's so jam packed with um, people that are, are selling singles. I think from uh, from our standpoint, uh, the longevity comes in the album. We we have a we we try to cater to a different customer base. Um, we try to cater to con customers, not consumers, and um, and I think uh, our our audience tends to skew a little bit older. I mean, the 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 thing that we realize with with Taylor that was really unique is that she had that young daughter, but she also had the mother and she also had the grandparent. So she had three generations and, um, and our music tends to, especially with her, tends to be music that is safe, not safe music, but safe, uh, that the parents want their kids listening to. Um, as opposed to some of the other music where, you know, parents are turning it off. And I think, uh, it, if you create positive music and, and you have that uh, concept of um, you're, you're, you're not just about the one song, you're about a collection of songs, you're about a career um, and growing the brand, it, 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 it helps. Uh, and, and I think the other thing is, is that social media is very much about, um, it's a little bit voyeuristic, it's a little bit where people look up to or aspire to be somebody. And I think the key thing for our artists is, is to maintain being somebody that they aspire to be. I mean, if you're in jail or you're you know, getting arrested or different things like that, over time, people don't aspire to be you. And so, um, you know, the, the concept is, is, is your lifestyle. I mean, Brantley's, you know, has a lifestyle. Justin Moore has a lifestyle. And if people identify with that lifestyle, the social media is just a peek into that lifestyle. And you can, cons it's, it's authentic because you're, you're over time giving people a view into your life. And it's not just, I didn't just tweet this picture of me hunting or I didn't just tweet this picture of me buying these pair of shoes. That, you know, it's, it's, it's about that lifestyle and people feel like they're a part of your life. And um, I think that's how you make it authentic. And, they, and speaking of authenticity, I mean, at the end of the day, it's biz there's business there. Right. And, you know, you're a record label. So what part does the label play in some of that interaction with the, 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 cu the customer, the fan? It, it, it varies. I mean, uh, when you're a tailor, she's got it handled. <laughs> you know, uh, she's... She, she truly um, knows who she is and, and she has a, a vision of how she wants to portray that. Whereas other acts, acts come in, they, you know, they don't have a Twitter account, they don't have a Facebook page, they don't have, a, they don't have anything. They're like, uh, you know, I just don't do that. And so when that's the case, we, we, we help them. We create those pages, we train them, we teach them about social media. We, 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 have to teach them how to give a great interview. We have to, we have to build them uh, and, and be that partner with them to help them. It's not that they're not authentic, they just don't, they've never had to have that skill set. And so uh, when you grow up in a rural environment, a lot of, you know, um, you just didn't have a lot of that uh, technology in front of you. And so, um, and that's the other unique thing about country is that um, country as a format is very middle America. And so, um, I think there's actually a, a huge advantage to giving, you know, you can be a bigger fish in a smaller pond in, in middle America as opposed to, you know, uh, gravitating to some of the major markets where, that, you know, that they have, there's no shortage of uh, uh, distractions. Right, <laughs> indeed. So. Now, interesting thing about Big Machine, especially as an independent, you have emerging artists like Ray Lynn, you have, at this point, huge, you know, global stars like Taylor Swift, albeit she's very young. Mm -hmm. But then you also have iconic artists that have been around for quite some time and continue to thrive, such as Reba, mm -hmm. Tim McGraw. If you don't mind talking a little bit about the dynamics between, you know, how you work with a newer artist, you know, a, a pop sensation, sure. and maybe someone that is tried and true and continues to resonate with audiences and will forever. Sure, I, I think one of the, the first artists that we kind of brought back was Reba when, uh, on Valerie. And, and um, 
at Tricia Yearwood uh, on Big Machine. Um, you know, we, we actually promoted Garth Brooks's, um, he, he, in the middle of his hiatus, came out with the greatest hits and came to us and we promoted um, three of the singles off that. And we actually set a record with the, uh, Garth Brooks, the only single that's ever debuted at number one uh, uh, on the, the Billboard chart. And so um, those iconic artists have a huge fan base, but there's a lot of those iconic artists that have let their fan base, that, that never, social media wasn't there when they were, had their huge fan base. And, and um, I remember Reba doing her first tweet. We said, you're gonna have to get on social media. <laughs> and now you can't stop her. I mean, she just tweets like crazy. And, and she's really, you know, she understands and, and she's, she's so amazing. I mean, Reba as, a, as an artist is just, authentic and, and is, is such an icon for our, our industry. And, and, and so radio or terrestrial radio has a very narrow uh, or, or, or country radio has a very specific playlist. And, and it's, you know, I, I think we all should understand, but, you know, country radio or radio in general is not there to um, play music. It's there to sell advertising. So the music is the carrot that uh, they have to attract a certain demographic to be able to charge an advertising rate. And so if your music doesn't attract that audience, you don't get played. And so um, right now, country radio has a very specific um, uh, audience that they're trying to target. And some of these um, iconic artists don't fit that target demographic. And so it's really hard to get them played. Um, and we, we recently partnered with Cumulus who um, flipped uh, about 30 of their stations initially, ultimately it'd be about 135 stations, to a, um, and, it's, and it's the first time that the, the platform is kind of separated into two genres, is there's, there's the hot country, and now there's what, the, what we're calling kind of an AC country, which is a mix of new music and classic music, um, or, or, or iconic music. And so what we wanted to do is, is with Cumulus to say, these are the artists, these iconic artists were on your platform all of these years and they don't necessarily fit in your current country, but let's create a home for them because there's a ton of fans out there that really want to hear new music from these iconic artists. We just can't, we can't get enough people to know that it's out there on these other channels. So um, we partnered with them and uh, we started uh, Nash Icon Records. And uh, Reba was our first artist on that. Um, uh, Martina's going to be our next artist, and uh, Ronnie Dunn, and, and a few others. That um, and and our goal is is to kind of actually create content for that platform. Is to create if you know new uh, and and we're actually flipping the model on on the um, iconic artists. Is is um, rather than having them come in and make albums, we're we're doing singles deals with them because they do have this established. Um, a base, they do have this established business mechanism um, that they just need singles uh, on the radio to keep people coming to the, their concerts and their shows. So we partnered with them and we said, you know, we want to be a part of the touring and we want to be a part of, of your ongoing career. Um, if you could record any song in the world and you could just focus on one song as opposed to ten songs, what would it be? And that's kind of our approach with some of these iconic artists, and we hope that we'll we'll have some of their you know legacy uh, you know, classic songs still in them and, and still to come. But uh, and then over time, if we have a, enough of those, we can make a, you know a, a collection of those. But the the great thing partnering with Cumulus is is that um, we don't have to worry about uh, the process of trying to get them played on radio. There that we've got a platform that is hungry for new music and we just feed that classic music right in and, and they love it because when they play a new song from Reba, they have an audience already. So they don't have to go out and, and they can target their advertising for that older demographic um, and, and that classic or iconic uh, artist fan base. And, and it's, it's really working. They flipped uh, a Nashville station and it went to number one in the market. So uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a viable platform. And, and it, it really helps these artists to not have to go on that radio tour and go all around. They, they just immediately get airplay and, and, and have a partnership with uh, a, a great uh, media partner. Awesome. And if there's any doubt, I mean, I don't think there, there can be doubt at how successful Big Machine has been. Um, you can't escape Big Machine on any news stream. So... Most recently, you know, there was all this talk about Snapshot, uh, Snapchat potentially looking to buy Big Machine, and 
I mean, Apple, look, and, and numbers like two hundreds of millions of dollars being thrown out there as far as the valley. Could you talk about that? I mean, you're always going to have people knocking on your door. I mean, that's the, the reason that, um, you know, a lot of our, um, uh, our new labels in our joint ventures. And so um, there, there's always people interested in your, in your business model in, in new ways. Um, we just haven't found the right partner yet. You know, and, and I think if, if, if there is an event like that, I think what we're looking for is one plus one equals three. And, and, and really uh, finding a way to um, plug in. I mean, some of our joint ventures, like, like the Icon deal, where literally when we come together, we're, we're more powerful combined than the two of us, and, and we just haven't found that yet. There's, there's always going to be rumors, and you know, Scott sits down at lunch with somebody, and next thing you know, so it, we, we actually get a, a lot of humor out of that. Got so. you. No. And, and it has uh, to be has to be flattering to see all those. It is. It, it it's it's great to you know. You, sometimes you just wonder, if, is it is it a slow news day? You know? right, right, right. But but you know, I, I guess we've kind of risen the level of some pe people's awareness. But it, it's 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 great that people are concerned, gotcha. <laughs> or, or aware. But uh, right. um, anyways, it, it 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 doesn't hurt uh, sure. our brand. You know, um, and I think that's that's what we're also trying to do is really grow Big Machine as a brand, as a as a quality brand that when uh, our artists are associated with our, our brand, they're proud of it. Um, in the in, in historically, there have been some great brands, you know, with Motown and with Warner Brothers and with a lot of different, you know, labels where artists were proud to be on that label. And I think our industry kind of got away from it and and and. Um, Artists started suing labels, and, and it became the big bad thing. And, and our goal has always been uh, to maintain that uh, level of quality and that level of trust with our artists that they're excited to be associated with our brand. Indeed. So now we're going to switch over to full sale on-air questions. So for those folks that have been tweeting their questions to the hashtag Full sale on air. We're going to go ahead and ask some of those questions. In the meantime, I want to please ask all of you to help me in thanking Andrew so much for all of his time and valuable information. Amazing insight. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. All right, so let's see here. Um, I have some questions that uh, have been sent to us. And Angela asks, if you were a college student again, what would you do to prepare for the career path that you've had? So this is kind of like a time machine question. Wow. Um, I think I would have paid attention more to um, a lot of the um, business uh, affairs and some of the accounting classes. <laughs> um, uh, I've, I've, I learned a, a ton about accounting just doing it and and so uh, and, and the, the other thing is, is understanding a contract understanding uh, how to read a contract and 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 really paying attention to um, the terms of a contract because uh, you know a lot of times people take it at face value versus really digging in and understanding what it means and and um, I think that's really an important thing for um, for people to understand, because that, that is kind of the roadmap of a relationship, especially in our, our business. So, um, but uh, the other thing is, I, I think I would have uh, spent a lot more time um, being exposed to a, a, a bigger audience than than the, my little small town <laughs> that I grew up in. Nashville was such a great place, uh, but I think. Uh, you guys have such an opportunity of, of all of the companies that um, you have the ability to go work for. Um, my path was I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I came to Nashville, and Nashville had this limited uh, ability for me to what to do. But, I mean, the, the ability for you guys to decide where you want to go and live, and um, uh, I think that's really important, too, because... Um, I came from Michigan, and, and it was this little small town, and I was like, what am I going to do to make a living here? And, and once my eyes got opened as to the ability or the opportunities out there, Nashville seemed like this big, you know, amazing place. But don't be afraid to move to L.A., to move to, you know, uh, Raleigh, to move to wherever the, wherever the business is, is going to take you. Uh, and and the, the key thing is to, to really enjoy what you do. Because um, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. 
and there's so many people that just have to get a job. And um, I, I understand having to pay the bills, um, but if you can afford to not have to work just to pay the bills and you can afford to do something that you absolutely love, it's amazing when those two collide because then the, the money just comes. It really does. That's great advice. And also a, a little tip about being happy yeah. in life, right? Well, you're, you're, you're going to spend a lot of time <laughs> doing what you're doing uh, in the 12 to 15 hour days. Um, if you're doing something you hate, that's a miserable life. Yeah. It really is. No question. All right. So Chris asks, at what point does an artist reach critical mass after releasing a single? I th well, I think uh, in country radio, it needs to at least be top 10. So um, and top 10 is, is, is basically a, there's a, you know, an audience chart. So there's one of the is media based and the other is, is um, billboard. Um, and I think billboard is based on spins, the number of spins. So as every record or radio station across the United States plays the record, um, you know, they aggregate all those spins and, and that's one chart. And then the other chart is the audience chart, which is every time it plays, they calculate how many people were listening, and, and so there's, you know, if you expose to a certain audience, and about top 10 gets that critical mass uh, of frequency. I think uh, the, the great thing about radio is it's an advertisement. I mean, it's a three-minute three, three minute advertisement that as soon as it's done, you're like, how do I, <laughs> how do I hear that again if you loved it? And um, hopefully you go buy it, you know, and, and um, so that and, and we see that as as we kind of get to that and XM Sirius XM is the other really interesting um, partner for us is that that's an audience that has that's a subscription based audience so you already have this audience that's that's willing to pay for music um, or pay for access and subscription in general but um, as you hit a certain frequency of plays on that you can just see your sales lift. Um, and, and I think that's also a great indicator for as well is that when you, you hit that critical mass and you don't see sales lift, that, that should be telling you something. <laughs> it's, it's, you've got the exposure, you've got the audience, but sometimes they just don't care. And so, and that's the hard part with our, our business is we grow to love a lot of these artists, but uh, we've had artists over the years that we've had number one singles you know, over time and um, it just doesn't connect and it doesn't sell. And so that's, that's the unfortunate side of this, is that you hate to uh, uh, change that relationship and, and let them go pursue other things. But ultimately, you know, if, if it's not connecting with an audience enough for them to pay for it, then it, it's, it's, we're still a business. We're still, uh, we still have to um, do something that's helping support that artist. Indeed. So Jacob asks, how do you recognize the potential an artist has to be confident in signing him or her? You see him live. You see them on stage, and it's just you have to see them in front of an audience. You you can tell if they're going to connect. That that's that's the hard part. There's there's some really talented, amazing people that are astounding artists. That like I said, nobody cares. They they just don't connect. They don't they don't want to aspire to be them. They don't the the music doesn't connect with them. And we always say it's this ear to heart connection. And, and if you have that ear to heart connection with an audience, um, that's, that's the thing that gets us excited. And if you go watch it, an act live and all of a sudden, you know, like I said, they show up early to, because they're the opening act and they leave when the headliner comes on, you know you've got something there. And, and, and Justin Moore is one of those guys where uh, it's, it's an experience to see Justin Moore. I mean, he is this four foot, Eight, I don't know, I'm five foot two, uh, just dynamo and it just relaxed, you know, good old Southern boy. And when he gets on stage, he's a rock star. His, his charisma just goes like crazy. And, and that, that energy and that excitement, um, that's when you know you have something. You can create something in the studio, you can create, uh, have somebody just be able to write a great song, but if it doesn't connect with an audience, then it's probably just not worth your time. Gotcha. And this is a windowing question, uh, which is becoming a big deal, clearly. Sure. Uh, Ethan asks, why was the vinyl version of 1989 released two months after the official release? Uh, security. <laughs> um, the, 
the mastering process, uh, making vinyl records, and capacity of, of record plants uh, to actually press the CDs uh, forced us to have a to, to not be able to go day and date. Um, uh, security on on a on a major release is hugely important. We we essentially um, push Universal beyond uh, their comfort zone every time. We we take our release date and we back into uh, when trucks are going to ship, when plants are going to ship, how many units are going to get shipped, so that you, the exact amount of records land at retail hopefully that Thursday before that Tuesday street date at the, war, at, the, at the latest. And for three records, we've made it almost all the way to Thursday or Friday before we've had a leak. And so that's a huge part of our initiative is to make sure that um, on release day is the first date that everybody gets to hear the music and there's that excitement. If your record leaks two weeks ahead of time and you know, there's a lot of people who want to be heroes, um, it, it really just diminishes that excitement for that release. And so um, we've worked really hard to try to, to maintain a, a plan where we can do that. And, and one of the hardest parts is the security around pressing vinyl um, and the process of getting that music to people that aren't in that kind of bubble. Gotcha. So, so Derek asks, what effect do you think that Scott Borchetta's appearances on American Idol was going to have on Big Machine? I, I think it's going to be amazing. I think I think it's going to allow us to have another. Um, we've we've got the connection with the voice, and this will give us um, the other coast and, and the ability to uh, really do some great A and R. I think the interesting part's going to be is is we are very specific in our genre, uh, and it's going to probably push us outside of our limits. And we're we're probably going to have a, a pop artist uh, on our our label, and so uh, it'll help us. Um, in other areas and, and kind of change our course. But I think it's, all, it's, it's really helped uh, from the standpoint of branding uh, Scott and it's allowed people to kind of see him firsthand uh, as to what he does. And, and his interaction with the contestants and things has just been amazing. And, and he's such a, a wealth of information. And I think anybody would be lucky to have him as a mentor. No I know problem. I have been. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Ethan wants to know, how does a radio single get chosen from an album? Um, I think a, a big part of that is, is, is our promotions team and Scott. Um, they really listen. Um, the, we listen to what's current, you know, or what's, what's trending. Uh, our promotions teams really um, have an understanding of what PDs are adding and not adding. Uh, and so... Um, we don't, we try to, if there's a group of songs that sound like this, we try to figure out what the next, uh, what the next phase of, of their programming strategy is going to be and, and try to beat it. Um, but it's a big part of um, the whole label needs to buy in. I mean, we play, you know, typically four or five of the, the, the cuts. We, we don't necessarily come in with full albums. So we usually uh, have the artist cut four to five songs. Uh, for that first single before making the entire album and just kind of get a feel for what direction they want to go. And um, we all just weigh in. They do, they do tests, um, uh, audience testing. They do a lot of different things to see it. And, and very often you'll see, a sing you'll see one or two songs rise to the top as, as the one that everybody picks. You know, the, the goal is, is to have four of them you know, so that you know what you can come with the next and the next and the next. And I would imagine there's probably a plethora of things that you could say to answer this question, but I want to go ahead and ask. It, uh, Carlos wants to know, exactly in which way does Big Machine support new artists? Wow. Um, I think, well, one, we, we, we give them a platform and, a, and an entire team. Uh, we um, give them a home and, and we wrap our arms around them and say, we believe in you. Um, what's your vision? And, uh, and we financially and monetarily, you know, support them. Um, and we are essentially the bank. Uh, only, I think, we like to think of ourselves more as, as kind of the, the partner in it, where um, we're helping to grow that artist brand. And, and I, th I think we listen to the, the artists. We, we, we don't want the artists to, we, they, we sign them and go, okay, 
you, you got to change your clothes, you got to sing this, you got to sing somebody else's songs and things. We, we want to sign artists that have something to say. And if they have a, a great way of telling it, uh, sometimes other people's music or, or other people have written songs that help them say what they want to say better than they can write it themselves. But it's always the challenge to make sure that we help them say what their audience feels in their approach is. And, and, um, and the other thing is that we're just, we just want to be honest, transparent partners with that artist. And um, so I think a new artist with us has an entire label group team as well. Uh, so it's not, if you're signed a big machine, you don't just have just that promo team and that you have 91 employees on your side. And um, they all compete you know, for, for certain things, but when you get to a certain point, um, uh, in, the, in your album cycle, it's all hands on deck. And I don't think some of the other labels have the ability to do that. I don't think that they're so siloed in everything they do. And it's, it's everything from, you know, we have a, what we call AD meeting um, uh, once a week, and it's essentially the entire label either calling in or in the room, and we talk about these things. And, and um, there are, we, we try to break down barriers. So you've got a finance person and a licensing person and a, and a publishing person and a an A&R person and a, you know, a, a, an attorney <laughs> all in the room, all dedicated to um, that artist. And I, I think that's very unique. And I would imagine at a bigger label, you're always going to have a priority yep. and somebody's going to... Unfortunately, a bigger, at the bigger labels, it's, it's a money thing. It, it, their, their priority is going to be focused on the artist that's making the most money. And so the artist that's generating the most money is going to get the most attention. Whereas um, we, we try to give every artist, regardless of what they're generating, the exact same attention. So um, in hopes that someday they will you know, be at the top of the, the right. scale. I think they call that artist development. They do. <laughs> they do. Uh, let's see here. Uh, someone online, I don't have a name, wants to know if you don't mind sharing top three things that you look for in signing an artist. You already shared one for sure, which is performance. If you don't mind talking maybe about the other two. My, my function at the label isn't necessarily signing the artist, but it, it, what, I, what I do see is, one, clearly that they connect with an audience. Two, they know exactly who they want to be. Um, and, and, and three, I think that there's somebody that you want to be around. So um, that's, that's really hard is sometimes an artist is really talented, has a connection, but is r just for whatever reason, you don't want to be with them. You don't want to hang out with them. You don't want to do that. And I think in our environment, I think that, that comes through. That fan wants to be around certain people. And um, having that um, kind of an engaging personality. Um, there's some artists that I'd, I never want them to leave. They're just, they're so funny. I mean, Rascal Flats guys are just, you get in a room with the three of those guys and you will be crying because they, they start feeding off each other and they, they start laughing and telling jokes and just, and literally uh, my heart, I, I just had a gut ache because I was laughing so hard. And that's, that, I mean, you want to be around those people. You want to help those people. If somebody is distant and elusive and, you know, y you don't necessarily want to help that person as much. So. And the passion is a big deal. Absolutely. Indeed. All right, so we have one last question online. Douglas wants to know, if you could start the company all over again um, with what you know today, what would be the biggest thing that you might change? Wow. I don't think we change anything. I think the, the, the hard part is we did everything the hard way. And the, we didn't necessarily do it. Um, I think there's some processes and things that um, from a finance and from uh, our contracts early on, I would have, you know, immediately when, when I came in, um, we flipped from a um, SLRP. So artists used to get paid on suggested retail price versus wholesale. And um, I don't know if you know the difference, but if you go to retail, it's suggested $14.99 and they're selling it for $10. Well, those two prices have absolutely nothing to do with what you actually get paid. I might get paid $7 a wholesale price, and then that VIG between the, the wholesale price and what the retailer sells it for is SLR, SLRP or is their markup. Um, so what we did is we just made all our contracts real simple. Look, if I get paid a dollar, I'm going to pay you a portion of that and streamline all the contracts. And I think 
Uh, early on, I think I would have also made it more of a, not a 360, but a uh, expanded rights so that it's, it's, we partner with all of these, we partner with this artist and we grow all of these segments of, of their business. Um, and, uh, and I think it's only fair that if we're spending that time and energy growing those segments of the business that we, we participate in them. And I actually think our approach in some of those segments would be helpful. I think there's a lot of people in some of those segments of the industry that we should, um, we should have been in a lot sooner. Uh, touring, publishing, uh, I wish we would have been in publishing from day one. It took, you know, we didn't start a publishing company until five years in. So, you know, some of those things when you look back, you're like, we should have done a lot more sooner, but I don't think I would have changed anything because uh, we learned lessons and, and, and we're still learning lessons. I think that's, that's the challenge for us right now is, is um, you know, that innovator's dilemma. You have to figure out how you're going to continue to change so that uh, you can survive and you can stay relevant. And um, um, having the cash flow that we have has allowed us to um, not be worried and be able to focus on certain things, but um, the industry is changing and we need to very much uh, stay ahead of, of the curve. Streaming is one of the things where, you know, you have an industry where you went from a $10 model to a Ninety to a dollar model to a tenth of a penny model, so you know the industry is changing, and so and it's not scaling. So uh, the only way that you can continue to make the same money in that dynamic is is for it to scale, and so um, we're still focused on the ten dollar model, <laughs> um, where it seems like the the rest of the world is is very much looking at that tenth of a penny uh, model, which. I don't know that that's really a great thing for our industry. I mean, I, I think we really need to focus on the business side of it and getting that streaming model up to a point that it can actually sustain uh, an industry which really needs um, the cash flow to be able to sustain it. Awesome. And I think we'd all vote for the $10 right. side as well. Well, speaking of learning, I know that we've learned an amazing amount of information today. Thank you so much for attending. And thank Andrew Cowles for all of his knowledge and information. And much success, sir. Thank you. All right. All right.